Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Serena Longo, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm so excited to introduce this virtual event with James Morton Turner presenting his new book, Charged, A History of Batteries and Lessons for a Clean Energy Future, joined in conversation by Adam Rome. Thanks so much for joining us virtually this evening. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. Our next science book talk, featuring XKCD creator Randall Monroe, takes place in person next Tuesday at Harvard's Sanders Theater. Tickets are still available through the Harvard box office. To learn more about this and our many other upcoming events, you can visit us at harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com slash science for more info. I'll be posting a link to our science research public lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you may have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat in just a moment, I'll be posting a link to purchase Charged on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. James Morton Turner is Professor of Environmental Studies at Wellesley College. He is author of the previous title, The Promise of Wilderness, American Environmental Politics Since 1964, and co-author of The Republican Reversal, Conservatives and the Environment from Nixon to Trump. Tonight, he'll be joined in conversation by Adam Rome, an expert on the history of our environmental of our relationship with the environment and a professor of environment and sustainability at the University of Buffalo. This evening, James and Adam have joined us for a discussion of Charged, which unpacks the history of batteries and explores why solving the battery problem is crucial to a clean energy transition. Science Magazine calls it an eminently readable, elegantly precise treatise on the topic of batteries. And the global interior author, Megan A. Black writes, Detailing the incremental successes in battery engineering and recycling alongside the industry's persistent failures in social and environmental justice, charged is nothing short of a manual for building a more humane, clean energy future. We have a lot to learn this evening. So without further ado, I'm delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, James. All right, I am really excited to be here. Thanks so much to Serena and the Harvard Bookstore for hosting the event, to Adam Room for participating in it, and to all of you for joining us. Um, my plan is to just start off with a short introduction, kind of 10 minutes or so to frame the book and then um, turn it over to Adam to lead off with some questions. And I am going to share my screen so I can just uh, show you a couple of slides. So give me one second to kind of do that housekeeping. Okay, I think you should be able to see my the cover of my book. And you know, this is you know, as an author, right? You write a book, and you've been working on this, and it's your book, and you've been kind of putting the pages together. And when you get the cover back, right, it's kind of this first chance to see how your book looks to you know looks to someone else who didn't know about, know about the project all along. And for me, getting the cover to charged was kind of this moment of aha, that is exactly what this book is about. And you know, the kind of all the inputs that goes into batteries and all the systems that batteries are implicated in, that's all captured in this cover. And so there was just one kind of point of discussion, which was, well, you know, how full should the battery be? Should it be 100% full? Should it be kind of on the red line and running out? And we settled at it being one third full, because that's the moment when you really kind of have to start thinking about that battery and um, you know what it's doing for you, and do you need to charge it up? And you know, really, that's what charged is all about. It's to help people think carefully about the place of batteries and a clean energy transition. 
And you know, we know that batteries are going to play a critical role in the 21st century. They're going to be powering electric vehicles. They're going to provide power backup for homes and offices and businesses. And on an even larger scale, they're going to help stabilize an electric grid that's increasingly dependent on renewable energy resources. But all of that's looking towards the future. And my training is as a historian, my PhD is in history. And what struck me about this as a historian is that in many ways, none of this is actually new. Since the early 20th century, batteries have played a pivotal role in the major systems of transportation, communication, and electrification. You know, so as I dug into the history, you know, realized that you know, batteries right from the start of the 20th century were playing a key role in starter batteries for gasoline cars. Right? It, they made it possible to scale up vehicles and make them as easy to use and help um, you know, create a dependence on automobility. But batteries have been, a lead acid battery has been a part of every one of those vehicles that was put on the road in the 20th century. Batteries at the start of the 20th century played a key role in early telephone systems and radios as well, all of which were initially battery powered. And if you go back and look at the you know, electric grid as it was being developed in the early 20th, centuries, 20th century, batteries were providing load leveling and other grid services for those early electric grids. So, you know, Today, we think of batteries as being everywhere, but they were actually you know, quite ubiquitous um, even in the early 20th century. And despite this ubiquity, both in the past and in the present, batteries are often a black box. You know, I, sometimes, right, they're literally a black box. But you know, questions like what's in them? Where do they come from? Who is implicated in manufacturing and disposing and recycling of them are all really important questions. And what I do in charge is tell the story of batteries in the 20th century to draw out lessons important to the clean energy transition ahead. Now, you know, to the extent most people, and this would be me um, 10 years ago, to the extent that I really thought a whole lot about batteries, it was often to wonder, you know, when am I going to get a better battery? You know, when's the next big battery breakthrough going to come? The battery that can charge in five minutes or might triple the range of an electric car or be made entirely of abundant and non-toxic materials. But in the history of batteries, those kinds of advances have been few and far between. It's an industry that's characterized by incremental advances, not revolutionary breakthroughs. So what CHARGE does is tell the story of how incremental advances in three key battery chemistries transformed the 20th century and have helped set the stage for a clean energy transition in the 21st century. So what I wanted to do is just kind of the book's organized around these case studies. So I just want to tell you a little bit about the kind of three kind of story, three key stories that I tell about these different battery technologies. And the first is that starter battery that was in all of the cars, right? The lead acid battery is one of the earliest battery technologies to be commercialized at scale. It's the rechargeable sat starter battery that is in you know, virtually every single car, even most electric cars still have a lead acid starter battery in them. Um, we think about them when they don't start our cars, which is actually what happened to me on my first day of class this semester. I got into the car to go to, to come up to Wellesley College and my car wouldn't start. It's you know, the irony. Um, but you know, lead acid batteries, are highly toxic, uh, yet they're also the single most highly recycled product in the world. And this is something that's really interesting because today, the most important source of lead is not mines. It's actually the built environment around us. And today we hear a lot about battery gigafactories, but really the earliest gigafactories were the lead acid battery factories of the 20th century. So that's a little bit about lead acid batteries. The second story I tell is about the rise of AA, AAA, nine volt disposable batteries. These batteries that are manufactured by the tens of billions every year. And you know, it's a really fascinating story because these are batteries that in some respects haven't changed at all, right? The size and shape of 
the disposable batteries was standardized way back, you know, kind of largely finalized by 1937. That's when the dimensions of AA, AAA batteries was initially codified. But at the same time, their performance has improved remarkably. And there's been some chemistry change, but the performance and shelf life of these batteries has improved tremendously since the 1920s. And you know, sort of their performance has increased, but a little known environmental success story has also been the removal of heavy metals from disposable batteries, right? People are often concerned about what do, what do I do with my you know, AA remote control batteries when I'm done with them? You know, can I throw them away or do I need to recycle them? And up until the 1980s, throwing them away was a real problem. The largest source of mercury and municipal household waste in the United States was coming from mercury that had been added into these disposable batteries. But in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, the battery industry transitioned uh, to mercury-free batteries, um, which markedly decreased uh, mercury in household waste. But you know, what's interesting about this to me is that doing that, it meant that the batteries, both to improve the performance and to get the mercury out, had to utilize increasingly pure materials, including zinc, electrolytic manganese dioxide, and graphite. And achieving that purity requires energy. In fact, it takes about 160 times more energy to source the materials, to process them, and manufacture one of those tiny little AA batteries, then that battery actually gives back to you during use. And unlike lead-acid batteries, these disposable batteries are almost never recycled. That's a little bit about the disposable batteries. But the batteries that have really captured public attention most recently, and which I spend the most time on in charge are the lithium ion batteries, which are in virtually probably all the devices you're using to watch this right now that are um, in you know, all of our smartphones and in the electric cars. And lithium ion batteries were first commercialized in the early 1990s by Sony. They were used in one of the early Sony camcorders. And the lithium ion batteries quickly displaced some older rechargeable battery technologies that maybe you remember. There used to be NiCad batteries and nickel metal hydride batteries. One of the challenges with the NiCad batteries is they were the rechargeable batteries with the memory effect where you had to be careful um, kind of at what point you recharged them. Um, but so there have been a lot of advantages to lithium ion batteries because they don't have problems like the uh, like the memory effect, but they also pose risks. Um, they have a potential for fire, which is different from other batteries. And so they have to be carefully managed to man or engineered to manage the risk of fire. So since the 19, since really the mid 1990s, lithium ion batteries have powered a mobile revolution that's enabled this new generation of smartphones and laptops. And now they're being scaled up, kind of building on the um, supply chains that were put into place in the 1990s and the early 2000s to scale them up to uh, the point that they can power electric cars and back up entire electric grids. But a major question is how to close the loop on lithium ion batteries, the way the lead acid batteries have been recycled. And the problem is that like the AA batteries, they're just much harder to recycle. So that's a little bit of a peek into the case studies around which this book is organized. So moving towards wrapping up kind of my introductory remarks, um, you know, Charged is filled with a lot of surprising factoids and interesting examples about batteries, but it's also a book that draws out some big conclusions about the prospects for and the challenges important to a clean energy future. So couple of points here to you know, highlight these themes. And one, and probably not a surprise, is that batteries are materially contensive. Their characteristics emerge from the very particular combinations of materials that make up the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte of these different battery chemistries. 
what this book does is it connects batteries to the places and communities where those materials have come from, including you know, the lead mines of Missouri, the artisanal cobalt mines of the Democratic Republic of Congo, the lithium salt flats of the Salar de Atacama in South America, and the graphite mines of China. It's not just a story of mining and extraction, it's also a story of processing, right? Purifying these materials. And in many ways, you know, these materials are as much made as they are mined. The second point I'll highlight is that, you know, this book shows how batteries are about more than just portable power. They're also about geopolitical power. And one of the biggest transitions this book traces is the shift in resource extraction and manufacturing away from the United States. Through much of the 20th century, the U.S. led the world in the production of lead and lead acid batteries. Uh, but lithium ion batteries are really a product of globalized supply chains that have centered around consumer electronics manufacturing in China. And you know, even though the materials that go into lithium ion batteries come from mines that are spread you know, around the world, most of those supply chains run through China for processing and manufacturing. Today, China controls nearly three quarters of the global lithium ion battery um, production capacity, you know, giving it a big head start in a clean energy transition. And the last point here is that weaning the world off of fossil fuels is going to require massively scaling up the production of batteries and the clean energy relevant materials such as lithium, cobalt, graphite, that they depend upon. And in one respect, this is an enormous challenge. It's going to require significant investments in extractive industries. In another respect, it's also an opportunity because most of the mines, the supply chains, and the factories needed to manufacture not just batteries, but solar panels and wind turbines and electric cars too, you know, most of them have not yet been built. And that means an urgent challenge is making sure that these supply chains from mine to factory are built, managed, and regulate in ways that are more just and sustainable than the fossil fuel status quo. So all of this points to the very last line of my book. And so I'm gonna give away the ending right here, but I'll just read that line for you, which is, quote, all of this is crucial to building a just and sustainability, clean energy future from the ground up. So I'll stop there. Adam, thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Jay, for uh, writing such a terrific book. And, um, uh, it's, it's for me, it's the most exciting book that I've read, not just this year, but for several years, because it shows so much about where we're headed, great lessons about how we can build a more sustainable future. Um, and it's also a model for historians of, of how to use all our skills as historians to uh, bring to bear on the challenges, the great challenges of our time. So, so congrats and, and thanks. Um, Thank you. You know, when um, you did, you didn't mention how you got onto the subject, uh, and and it's it's quite different from your earlier work. You've you, you've written before about environmental politics, the environmental movement, and and that's a key part of this book too that we'll come back to in a few minutes. You have some brilliant insights about blind spots in contemporary environmentalism, but. But um, but batteries wasn't an obvious next project for you. So <laughs> how did you how did you come to this? This book was a long time coming. I actually started the work on this book back in 2010. And yeah, I mean, first, I mean, just kind of the departure from my first book. My first book was about the politics of public lands protection and wilderness protection. And, you know, so I went from writing a book about people trying to protect wilderness areas to writing a book that, you know, draws the conclusion that we need to scale up extractive industries, right? So, you know, there's been a, a 
a lot of water under the bridge. And I think both of those things are really important. But kind of the specific way that I got onto this book was just realizing that I was teaching an intro class in the environmental studies department at Wellesley. And my students you know, are so smart and they had so many uh, insights and just kind of knowledge they brought to the table about you know different energy technologies. And they knew a lot about you know, both the importance of and the problems with fossil fuels. You know, they could talk about nuclear power. They could talk about, um, you know, even then, you know, renewable energy technologies and, you know, the challenges of, you know, integrating them into the grid. And, you know, everybody, you know, kind of in my intro class and talking about the energy system and, and energy transition knew that batteries were going to play a role in this. Um, but at the time, and I was in the same boat, I mean, batteries really felt like a black box. I just, you know, I didn't know really what the difference was between the battery and my car, you know, my old, you know, Toyota Sienna minivan um, versus, you know, the kinds of batteries that we were just starting to hear about in vehicles like the Chevrolet uh, uh, Volt and the uh, Nissan Leaf and, you know, the kinds of batteries that could support an electric grid that, you know, depended much more on renewable energy. And so for me, you know, that was the motivation for the book, you know, both for myself and for my students was to begin to unpack this black box of batteries in a way that didn't just focus on the technical questions of, you know, the specific you know, energy and the you know, capacity um, and the electrochemistry, but also connected it to the landscapes and the people who were involved in providing the materials and managing the waste that comes from these different technologies. So yeah, that was my entry point. Um, yeah, um, and, and you do that wonderfully. Uh, you, anyone reading your book can't help coming away uh, with an intimate understanding of social history and, and, and uh, even political history, as you said, uh, as well as in environmental history. Um, say one more thing about your students, because one of the things I loved about the book, you, you acknowledge them in the acknowledgments, and that's not unusual, um, although not as many professors do that as, as I wish, <laughs> but, but you come back to them at, in your conclusion, and, um, you know, thinking about what they would make of your argument and how they've pushed you to articulate assumptions um, that you have that maybe they don't have even though you're you're both keenly interested in environmental stuff but but being in an environmental studies department rather than a history department you you have students as you say very passionate about the, these issues um how else did they shape the book not just that they pushed you into it in the beginning but but the kinds of things that they led you to conclude yeah well, you know my students contributed to this book in a lot of ways and one is just kind of i had a lot of student research assistance um i probably i don't know had a dozen students who played an important role in researching, fact-checking, you know, building the website for the book. And so just a huge shout out to them for that help. Um, but you know, in can you, you're asking the broader question, you know, how they shaped my my thinking and um, some of the conclusions that I draw. And I think, you know, one of the big questions is, you know, what role technology is going to play in this clean energy transition. You know, are we going to see, you know, things like electric vehicles, you know, substituting for existing forms of mobility? Um, or is there going to be, you know, some kind of cultural shift where, you know, we downscale and, you know, maybe travel less or use, you know, electric you know, bikes that are uh, less resource intensive as opposed to things like electric cars. And, you know, I think my, my students have um, kind of a lot of questions about what that world would look like and how we can advance uh, a transition that does focus on, you know, ideas like degrowth and downscaling. And I think those are really important questions to ask. We have a lot of conversations uh, around that and in my classes, but, you know, one of the conclusions that I come from or come to in charge is just that, you know, the climate uh, emergency is here. We need to make change really fast. And, you know, affecting some of those large scale shifts in economy and culture are going to take time that we don't have. And so kind of my plea at the end of this book is that we really need to face up to the scale of material extraction that is going to be necessary to, you know, substitute clean energy technologies for fossil fuel technologies. And, you know, that means, you know, focusing more on 
extractive industries and questions of mining and you know where the stuff comes from that winds up you know not just in batteries but other technologies as well and you know so you know arguing for you know focusing on extraction and better regulating it um you know that's you know not an easy thing to do when you know many environmentally minded people including some of my students you know really think the answer is scaling things down and making them less materially intensive and therefore you know less uh, imposing a, a smaller cost on on the environment that's a wonderful segue to thinking about what you what you have to say about environmentalism more broadly i think um uh, uh you you draw a bunch of lessons i think for anyone who's interested in environmental activism, environmental policy, uh, and you're really pretty hard hitting about some of the blind spots in, in, the, in the visions of environmentalists, uh, even though you're sympathetic to the Green New Deal, you have a critique of it. Uh, so what would, how, what would you say are the most important things that um, batteries have made you realize that wilderness hasn't or any of the other kinds of things that you thought about before uh, about where the environmental movement could be better, could be stronger, could be um, more practical, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, well, you know, I've been telling people for a long time that I'm working on a book about batteries. And I guess, you know, in my opening remarks, I said, right, you know, often when we think about batteries, it's like, what's the next, you know, best, you know, breakthrough going to be? But really, the other question that I always get about batteries is, you know, what do I do with my batteries? Like, where do I recycle my batteries, right? Everybody's got the yogurt tub, you know, full of batteries in a closet, you know, wondering what to do with them. And, you know, I think, kind of that question, uh, which I really have gotten a lot, you know, speaks to something important about environmentalism, which is, you know, there's been a tendency both in environmental policy and I think kind of the culture of environmental environmentalism to focus on how we manage waste and, you know, how can we better recycle things and you know, close the circle on supply chains, you know, all of which is important. But I think that's also meant that there hasn't been as much attention to where things come from in, in the beginning. Um, you know, how are these different technologies, you know, in the case of batteries, you know, where are they sourced from, right? People much more want to know how do I recycle that AA battery than you know, where did it you know, actually come from in, in the beginning. And I think implicit in that is the hope that we could recycle it and make a new battery out of it. But you know, as I explained in Charged, you know, that's a very difficult challenge to solve. But kind of stepping back from that and just thinking about environmentalism, um, you know, which is incredibly diverse, but you think you know, if you're going to start making some generalizations, you know, environmentalists have often had problems with extractive industries. They've had a lot of concerns about synthetic materials and kind of, you know, elevated the value of things that are more natural or more organic, and you know, often had a suspicion of large-scale activities, um, you know, human activities, industries. Then, you know, like by every one of those measures, right, batteries are a really big problem um, because they're dependent on extractive industries. They're made of synthetic materials and they're manufactured at an enormous scale. But if environmentalists want to make sure that you know, technologies that are going to be important to a clean energy transition are manufactured and sourced more responsibly, and, and one of the sets of points I make is that we can't approach them through the lens of just being suspicious of extraction and concerned about synthetic materials. We need to lean into and understand these systems. We need to gain what I describe in the book as a more material form of environmentalism to kind of you know, foster an industrial ecological literacy so that people can care about issues of social and environmental justice can you know, spotlight and, 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 and pay attention to and help improve the supply chains that are so important to these technologies. And some of that work is already happening, but you know, historically this hasn't been kind of a core focus for, um, for many people who care about the environment. And so, you know, that's the the um, nudge that I that I try to give to um, kind of how we think about environmentalism and environmental issues. You know, I hadn't really thought of it till just now, but um, I mean, not only thinking about batteries and extractive injuries industry, but thinking about business in general. 
um, it's not what environmentalists, many of them at least, naturally <laughs> want to do. Um, and and so you're a model, I think, of someone who's forced yourself out of the comfort zone of thinking about things that environmentalists have always thought about um, in order to, to understand things that are absolutely critical, um, but, but uh, aren't necessarily as beautiful to look at <laughs> as a sublime landscape. Um, and uh, you, one of the most striking things in your book is your discussion of what you call the paradox of purity, that a lot of the, the greener technologies turn out to require, if you look inside the box, as you say, um, incredibly e eco uh, uh, costly um, ways of producing the super pure materials that are needed to make the batteries work in spectacular ways. Um, and so uh, it seemed to me that you're also saying that we all need to be a lot more sophisticated about how we think of what's greener. Um, that, that, that we can't, and it's not just a matter of greenwashing. Uh, it's, it's a matter of seeing the trade-offs and, you know, it's better in this way, not in that way. Is that, is that one of the, the big takeaways for you as well? Yeah. Um, you're, yeah, the paradox of purity and just, you know, how much work and energy goes into producing these highly purified, refined materials. These are the materials that are as much, you know, really more made than they are mined. And, you know, kind of getting back to that question about environmentalism, you know, and you're really kind of going back to the Green New Deal. I mean, you know, there often hasn't been a lot of attention kind of in environmental circles, environmental policy to do to do to this. But you know, if you go back and you look at the Green New Deal, which I was totally inspired by, right? This, you know, the way it reframed climate politics in this country and connected issues of climate change and put issues of social justice right at the foreground. I mean, you know, there is so much compelling about the Green New Deal. Um, you know, if you Think back to the 1930s, though, and the New Deal, and you know, lots of you know questions we could raise about that comparison. But one thing that really stood out to me about the Green New Deal was that you know it talked about this massive shift and towards a clean energy um, future, but it didn't discuss the materials that were going to be needed to make that transition, right? And you know, in the same way, right? The the New Deal back in the 1930s, and it wasn't just about creating jobs and um, you know, federally sponsored programs. It was about mobilizing ton, you know, tons and tons of concrete and aluminum and asphalt that went into all of these uh, projects that were developed as part of the New Deal. And you know, so one of the real changes I think that's begun to accelerate in the last two years and kind of transitioning from the Green New Deal to the Inflation Reduction Act is that people who are you know concerned and the policymakers and the uh, you know, uh, advisors who are pushing for this transition have really started to focus on the importance of these supply chains and the materials and how they are processed and where they're being processed and you know the trade-offs that are inherent in this, uh, you know, in advancing these kinds of clean energy technologies, including batteries. And so suddenly there's a lot of discussion around, you know, where these materials are being sourced and the purity levels and the environmental costs of that in ways that I think have, you know, are going to be really important to supporting this clean energy transition going forward and, you know, ensuring that we do it in a way that, you know, is as sustainable as, as possible. I'm sure that um, some people in the in the Zoom audience will maybe want to ask you more about uh, the Inflation Re uh, Reduction Act and some of the lessons you would take from your study uh, about how that's implemented. So that's a reminder that if you do have questions um, in, a, in a few minutes, we will uh, start looking at those questions from you uh, through the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, but let me turn back to, to another huge subject that I think you brilliantly um, illuminate, which is just energy in general. I mean, there's a zillion books now about the history of oil or the history of coal, history of electrification, um, uh, but, but there isn't anything like your book. And, and I, I think your book shows new ways of thinking about energy generally. It's not just 
a brilliant study of batteries. So what, what do you think you learned about energy that you hadn't really thought about when you were just reading about oil or coal or electricity that would be interesting to us? Yeah, well, I, I'm sure if I were not just trained as a historian, this probably wouldn't have been such a big surprise to me. But yeah, I did. You know, I did a lot of reading around energy, especially as I was starting this project. And you know, the books that I read about energy were really about kind of the big pieces of the energy system. Um, you know, it was about kind of the expansion of the energy system, um, making energy increasingly abundant and available, you know, lots of costs that came with that, but also making it accessible to more people around the world. And you know, a lot of these books about energy were really about kind of the quantity of energy and how important it was to modernization. And so, you know, in those kinds of books, like batteries were a footnote, right? I mean, that was what I was looking for, right? It's like, you know, they talk about batteries in these books and batteries were a footnote at best because compared to, you know, nuclear or fossil fuels or hydroelectricity, you know, batteries just delivered, you know, far too little energy to really matter, it seemed to, you know, the big energy transitions of, you know, that have been central to, to human history. You know, but I knew that there was something about batteries that you know really mattered. And what I kind of came to realize, and this was you know doing some interdisciplinary reading, was that you know the batteries weren't important because of how much energy they supplied, right? It was they were important because of the qualities of that energy, right? That it is energy that's portable, that it can be stored, and that when it's needed, it can be available instantaneously. Um, and you know, it's those qualities, right, this portability and instantaneity of um, batteries that made them a key enabling technology, for so, you know, for so many different uses. And, you know, I've come to realize, right, that, you know, energy quality is, you know, fundamental to understanding the advantages and disadvantages of, you know, all sorts of energy technologies, but it really explains why batteries have been so important his historically and, and in the present, right? It's not because of the quantity of energy that they can provide, it's the qualities of that energy. So, yeah, that was, you know, that was my big takeaway um, for kind of energy history. And and would you um, looking ahead, if if we started to think more about the quality and not the quantity, how would how might that shape our energy policies, our energy decisions um, as a society going forward? I know you know that that's not something that you um, address at great length in the book, but I think it's 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 lurking there in a bunch of ways, and maybe you want to say more. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I bring it back to that larger question of you know how do we manage the materials that are needed for these batteries and other technologies because ultimately the the qualities of the energy um, or batteries in the energy system you know, really depends upon the upon the electrochemistry of the batteries, which then relies on the materials um, of the battery and you know the specificity of those materials. Um, how they're processed, their purity levels, and you know what kinds of you know batteries they um, you know can can produce. And so, you know, for me, you know, we want to have batteries that are high density that can store lots of energy, can charge and uh, be recharged quickly. Um, you know, focusing on the materials and how they're sourced and where they come from. You know, that's the urgent policy issue. Um, so I would connect it back back to that topic. One other thing you're that you're quite candid about in in, in your acknowledgments and uh, is um, and you and you've talked about it today too is how much you've had to learn from people who <laughs> aren't historians in order in order to do that uh, in order to do this work. So you did interviews. You you've done any number of things that historians don't always do. Um, what would you say has been most interesting to you, most challenging that you're or that you're most proud of and in, in how you've gotten a hold of uh, and and it's not just that you understand it, but you also explain it incredibly lucidly as I think any reader of your book will feel that that um, they, they know vastly more about all these technical issues as well as the the deeper philosophical and policy questions. but what what would you say? What was most challenging, and what are you most 
you know, looking back, most satisfied with in the way that you came to approach a topic that, you know, was quite different. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I tried to explain things well. I'm sure there are some errors and mistakes. Um, and I think I, I just have an incredibly deep respect for you know, kind of material science and um, kind of electrochemistry and the and just the complexities of the um, processing technologies that are central to um, producing so many of these, in this case, battery technologies. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of a surprise to me. I didn't fully appreciate um, really just kind of the full consequences and challenges and sourcing these materials and preparing them in a way that they can be used in batteries. Um, but, you know, I, I learned uh, just a tremendous amount from talking to people, going to, you know, conferences way outside of my field, um, visiting, you know, places like, you know, lead smelters and, you know, talking to the people that work there, but also talking to the people who, you know, lived in, you know, communities that were right beside the mines and hearing about the concerns they had and, you know, managing the, you know, legacy issues that have come from, you know, the extractive industries that are important to batteries. And so, you know, I felt like I've talked to people kind of across the supply chain and, you know, learned something at every step of the way. That, um... And mentioning the people who live in communities nearby, uh, maybe this will be my last question before we turn it over uh, to questions from the Zoom audience. But um, you do, I think, a wonderful job all throughout of, of really putting uh, every part of the battery story in, in, in a social context. You know, who, who, who's affected by this? Um, and 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 addressing issues of social justice. So, um, how much of that was was something that you were planning to do? Was that something that the the story led you to as you got more deeply into it, or was it was it something that you always thought was a key part of the story that you really had to make prominent? You know, that was one of my goals from the start was you know, trying to understand the social justice um, implications of the battery industry and, you know, trying to you know, spotlight um, frontline communities that were um, you know, tied to the extractive industries that are have you know, been important to all of these different battery technologies. And you know, doing that in a, in a comparative framework, because you know, as I mentioned at the start, right, there's been a shift in battery manufacturing away from the United States. That's also meant imposing those burdens on communities and other parts of the world. And you're know, trying to understand kind of how, you know, efforts to manage the costs of um, materials like lead, uh, lead or cobalt or nickel, right? You know, how that looks different in the United States, um, you know, versus, you know, what it looks like in uh, countries elsewhere in the world, right? I mean, one of the big changes in the U.S. has been closing down the lead industry. At this point, there are no more primary lead smelters in the United States. And in part, that's a product of, um, you know, better environmental regulations, um, focus on environmental justice issues, but it hasn't meant that we're not using lead, right? The lead is coming from somewhere else. And so trying to you know, understand, you know, how has that meant that, you know, how has that led to implicating other communities and the supply chains important to lead? And how should we think about those, you know, what's happening in the U.S. and what's happening elsewhere in the world? How should we think about that together? Great. Um... Looking at the questions, one follows up on that. Um, the Biden administration is ramping up domestic sourcing of lithium for lithium ion batteries. And many domestic sources of lithium lie on or near Native American reservations. How do you recommend protecting Native Americans' health, cultural resources, and self-determination while extracting the materials needed for the batteries? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. It's an essential question. You know, I don't have the answer for how to do that. But I think, you know, what was not part of the conversation five years ago um, was, you know, the need to put these issues of, you know, a boom in lithium production poses risks for 
local communities and as the um, question you know highlights indigenous communities in the united states but also elsewhere in the world right indigenous uh, protest against lithium extraction in the uh, um, salt flats of south america has been uh, an important part of the discussions around resource development in that region over the last 10 years and so you know asking questions about this um, you know being a part of the regulatory processes where environmental impact statements are put out and you know raising these questions these concerns um, and i think you know ultimately and to come to the second part of that question the inflation reduction act does include a lot of policies um, building on other biden administration initiatives that are meant to develop um, you know, domestic supply chains, but it's not enough just to get lithium or any of these other materials uh, from the U.S. or our fair trade allies. I mean, ultimately, we want these materials produced wherever they're produced around the world in ways that are more just and more sustainable. And to do that means, you know, imposing requirements around the, you know, what extent local communities are involved, to what extent mines are developed in ways that you know, minimize waste um, and water pollution, uh, minimize water usage, uh, you know, provide for cleanup after mines are shut down, right? So ensuring that policies like the Inflation Reduction Act or whatever comes next, right, includes those kinds of performance-based standards that can incentivize companies to honor the concerns and interests of indigenous communities to you know take measure of the ways that they're trying to minimize the impacts of their operations in local areas and make sure that's supported by the policies that are being developed um, at the national level so you know I, I think it's a really important issue and it's one that you know we need to ensure that there are much better regulations in place Some of the other questions are about um, the energy use that's part of this system, not just the, obviously the batteries produce energy, but one question is how much concern is there about the energy that's put into scaling up of battery production uh, or the energy put into recharging batteries once many of them are, are in use? When you talk about weighing one environmental risk against another, do we know what kind of costs that will have? Yeah, I mean, there are significant um, energy inputs, and I'm going to focus more on the material inputs tonight, but, you know, significant energy inputs that go into manufacturing all of these different battery technologies. And, you know, I expect many people who are um, you know, part of this tonight, you know, have heard that manufacturing a, an electric vehicle is both more materially intensive and more energy intensive in terms of the upfront um, manufacturing costs of a vehicle. And, you know, that's definitely true. But eliminating fossil fuels and gasoline um, from the operation of those vehicles, you know, over the course of a year, two years, three years, depending on how clean the electricity grid, you know, offsets that initial investment of energy but you know all of that is to say that you know, yes there's an increase in energy demand for manufacturing these products and you know, as part of transitioning the electric grid right and the u.s now has goals right to have 100 percent clean uh, electricity on the grid in 2035 right that's going to require ensuring that we've got a grid that's you know has the capacity and is resilient enough to you know support manufacturing these clean energy technologies in ways that depend upon renewable electricity instead of fossil fuels and and that's a real challenge I mean, some of these industries depend upon very high levels uh, you know high temperatures for the smelting and refining processes and transitioning that away from fossil fuels to electricity um, you know, poses uh, another set of engineering challenges. But it's also one, you know, if you pay attention to the world of you know, battery manufacturing, that you know, battery manufacturers are working on alternative strategies for um, you know, producing the batteries and sourcing the materials that you know, rely more on electricity that can be clean electricity as opposed to um, conventional thermal fossil fuel technologies. One of the other questions that's a little outside the 
the direct realm of your of your book, but but you might have some interesting thoughts about it. Um, so the question says, electric cars will help decarbonization as long as electricity is coming from renewables or 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 nuclear. Um, are you concerned that we may get uh, more that we may have to produce more electric cars than we can provide them with carbon free energy? Um, is that like putting the cart ahead of the horse? And maybe a different way of putting it. It's, it's a systems. You know, it's a, it's a really it's a systems level question, right? I mean, we need to plan for this transition, right? And it's a transition that needs to happen so quickly, right? It, you know, it seems possible, right? I mean, just you know, reading or hearing the news from California, you know, over the last day and all of the concerns about managing the electric grid and demand in light of the um, you know high temperatures in California, you know, just a reminder of how fragile the electric grid is, and we're at this moment where it's changing so quickly. You know, if you go back and you look at a graph, and this is something I talk about in the book, but if you look at a graph of, you know, electricity generation in the United States kind of after World War II, and it's really a pretty boring graph because it's just more and more of the same. I mean, natural gas, you know, really starts to ramp up, you know, after at the start of the 21st century. But now we're in this moment where the electric grid is incredibly dynamic, right? The decline of coal and the rise of natural gas and now the rise of renewable energy, it's all happening so quickly that doing that kind of systems level planning, you know, are we gonna have the capacity to support electric vehicles? I mean, that's a real challenge. But another question is, you know, to what extent can electric vehicles with larger batteries potentially help stabilize the electric grid in the future? You know, the Ford uh, F-150, right? Kind of one of the big you know, advertisements that Ford makes for that vehicle is that it can supply power back to a house back, you know, and now they're talking about school buses that can do the same thing. And so I think, you know, what, that question's a really good one and it just gets it, you know, highlights kind of how dynamic this arena has suddenly become in the last, decade because electric cars are going to increase the demand for electricity and it's going to mean building more solar panels and more wind turbines and you know, potentially keeping nuclear online longer but you know electric vehicles could potentially play an important role in helping to stabilize the grid if we're able to integrate them in ways that you know they can supply electricity to it a couple other questions are about um the materials in in batteries and um you know, on the one hand, you said that uh, the, the history has made you realize how few really revolutionary changes there have been much more incremental. But the questioners want to know, number one, um, do you see the potential for developing organic batteries uh, that instead of metals that need to be extracted, get their power from polymers that can be synthesized? Uh, and then the other question is, um, do you, do you have any ideas about what the next lithium might be? Uh, what would be the, the, you know, the batteries of the future? So organic batteries, is that possible? If, uh, if not, are there other exciting developments that you've heard people talking about that might or might not happen? Yeah, well, I, this is a question that gets me out of my realm of, um, I mean, historians are good at talking about what's happened. Um, so figuring out what's gonna happen next in the battery industry is something I don't feel like I have a whole lot of insight into. I mean, one thing I you know really come to appreciate is how many false starts there have been in the battery industry. I mean, just how many times it seems like there's a new technology that has the potential to, um, you know, to scale and to make a difference. And, you know, I'm hoping that we, you know, come up with batteries that are, you know, less energy efficient or intensive to manufacture that use more abundant materials. But, you know, for my, you know, when you think about the time scale of, you know, how quickly we need to electrify the transportation sector and really everything else, we don't have a lot of time to scale up the sourcing and the supply chains and the manufacturing capacity. And so, you know, in the end, I focused, uh, charged on lithium ion batteries because there is so much momentum behind that industry that it's really hard to imagine another battery technology displacing it you know, in over the course of the next decade, um, just because of the scale of investment in manufacturing that's happening right now. Um, but as far as organic um, batteries go, that's not something I, I know um, 
anything about. And you know, as far as what the next kind of advance in lithium ion battery technology will be, I mean, there's so much work being done on that. And I guess one thing that seems, you know, I guess I have some confidence in is I think we'll see changes on the anode side. I think the integration of silicon into the anodes of lithium ion batteries uh, promises some gains, not revolutionary gains, but significant incremental gains. And it seems like that's being piloted at a uh, kind of small scale, right, with um, smaller um, portable devices and will likely get scaled up into larger applications in things like electric vehicles. And that could you know, definitely improve lithium ion battery performance. But that really you know, highlights kind of one of the interesting things for me is just how important kind of a ladder of implementation has been for lithium ion batteries. Like we would never get electric cars if there hadn't been so much um, work and uh, research and you know, manufacturing capacity developed to support the consumer electronics industry initially. That's really what made it possible to then scale up that technology to, uh, you know, grid scale uh, or you know, vehicle scale. So you know, any new battery technology is very likely going to have to go through that same ladder of implementation, and that just takes time. Uh, one last question from the Zoom audience, at least for the moment. Um, uh, someone, I, I guess, from the question believes that nuclear power is an important part of the future in dealing with climate change. and so. Um, thinks of environmental opposition to nuclear energy in the 1970s as something that uh, was was ultimately self-defeating. Um, so do you, whether you accept the premise of that question or not, do you see examples in your story of places where people have um, had a, public interested goals uh, that have turned out to have um, seriously unexpected consequences or that have created problems in dealing with the challenges that we have now? Or is that not something that you think is part of the story? I'm sure it's part of the story. Kind of the exact example that would speak to that. Um, not pulling off the top of my, off the top of my head. Um, yeah, and, you know, I'm deeply concerned about the challenge that climate change poses. And I'm of the mind that we need to consider all potential you know, strategies for addressing it. So, you know, I'm not excited about nuclear to go back to the original question, but, you know, in kind of writing this book has really made me appreciate how important um, electrification is likely to be to addressing the climate challenge. and. Uh, in the near term and kind of in that scenario, you know, I think continuing to discuss the role that nuclear technology and future technologies, nuclear technologies might play. And that's one more important piece of the conversation that deserves scrutiny, just like batteries do. That's all the questions from, from the Zoom audience. Anything else that you wanted to, to add as, as, as a last word? This was wonderful. I, it's great talking with you, Jay, and thanks to the Harvard Bookstore for, for bringing us together again today. But any anything else you wanted to add? I'll just end by thanking you, Adam, thanking everybody who's come and uh, Serena from the Harvard Bookstore for hosting. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Um, and thanks so much to our wonderful speakers this evening. Um, I've just put a link in the chat one more time um, to purchase charged on harvard.com. I Definitely recommend you check that out. Um, and uh, just wonderful to have you both here and in the audience as well. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Keep reading, keep learning and be well. Thanks so much.